Is our behaviour the result of genetics, or is it down to our experiences? Are criminals born that way, with a genetic abnormality, or is it the product of how they've been raised? And what about mental disorders? Are they influenced by biology or the environment? Ah, the old nature versus nurture debate. Which one is it? Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. This video is part of the issues and debates topic in psychology, and and in this video, we're going to explore the nature versus nurture debate. But today, that isn't the debate. And that's because so much research has demonstrated that you can't really separate them. The issue is not nature versus nurture, but rather nature and nurture, because both are important. Most psychologists agree that we are influenced by both our genes and our experience. Nature and nurture are both involved. And so the nature and nurture debate is actually about how they interact with each other, known as an interactionist approach. It's about the relative contribution of each, about how much influence nature and nurture have. But for those new to the debate, what do psychologists even mean by the terms nature and nurture? Well, the nature view assumes that abilities are innate or inborn. They see heredity as being more influential. Heredity is the genetic transmission of both mental and physical characteristics from one generation to another. The nature side of the debate is founded in nativist theory. Nativism is the view that certain skills or abilities are native or hardwired into the brain at birth. In contrast, the nurture view assumes environment and experience are more influential. The nurture side of the debate is founded in empiricist theory. The term empiricism comes from the Greek word for experience, and so the nurture view states that abilities come from learning and experience. They would view the mind as tabula rasa, or a blank slate, on which experiences are to be written. So, consider the approaches in psychology. Here we can see that behaviourism and social learning theory would be nurture, whereas biology would be, unsurprisingly, mainly nature. But what do we do with these ones? Well, they contain elements of nature and nurture. Some have more nature than nurture, and others put more emphasis on nurture than nature. They are both. I actually created a free resource that goes into each of these approaches and how they relate to the debates, including the nature and nurture debate. So if you'd like to check that out, it's linked down in the description below for you. Let's now consider examples from other areas of psychology to show this interaction between nature and nurture. Some of these examples you'll find covered in greater detail in other videos on the channel that I'll also link down in the description for you if you want to check them out. First up, brain plasticity. This is the idea that the brain can change and reorganise its structure, nature, as a result of experiences in life, nurture. Maguire et al. in 2000 conducted research on the brains of London taxi drivers. For those who don't know, London taxi drivers have to pass a test called the knowledge. This is a test about how well they can navigate around London and most people take at least two years to train for and complete the test. They scanned the brains of each participant using an MRI machine which provided an image of the structure of their brain. They found that the London taxi drivers showed a larger posterior hippocampus compared to non-taxi drivers. In other words, the taxi drivers' experience of navigating the streets of London nurture, placed such a high demand on their spatial processing that the brain changed its structure, nature. In fact, they found a positive correlation. The more time a participant had been a London taxi driver, the larger the size of the hippocampus. This shows the interaction between nature and nurture, and the relative contribution of both. Second example, OCD. One explanation for OCD relates to the role of genetics. Evidence for the role of genetics in OCD comes from twin study research. As a reminder, there are two types of twin. Monozygotic twins share 100% of their DNA. They are identical. Dizygotic twins share 50% DNA. They are non-identical. If one twin has OCD, the likelihood that the other twin develops OCD should be higher for monozygotic twins than for dizygotic because they are genetically identical. 
Research by Nestle et al. in 2010 showed that of all the twin study research published to date, that the concordant traits in monozygotic twins were higher than dizygotic twins. Monozygotics had a 68% concordant rate for OCD if one twin had it, and dizygotics had a 31% concordant rate. This demonstrates the potential influence that nature has on OCD. However, whilst this research clearly shows the involvement of nature in OCD, it also indicates that it's not just nature. If OCD was purely genetic, we would expect the concordant traits for monozygotics to be 100% because they are genetically identical. They share 100% DNA. However, this is never the case. So this suggests that there must be something else involved in OCD, and many have pointed to the influence of environmental factors, in other words, the role of nurture. An alternative explanation for OCD is the diathesis stress model. Diathesis originates from the Greek word for vulnerability. This model proposes an explanation for how biological and environmental factors may be interconnected. It suggests that genetics may be involved in that they create a predisposition or vulnerability for OCD. In other words, some people may have the specific genes which makes it more likely that they will develop OCD. But OCD may never develop unless there's an environmental trigger, a stressor. The diathesis stress model suggests that environmental factors can trigger or increase the risk of developing OCD. Some research suggests that OCD may be more common in people who have been bullied, abused or neglected, and it sometimes starts after an important life event such as childbirth or a bereavement. Cromer et al. in 2007 found that over 50% of the OCD patients in their sample had a traumatic event in their past. Therefore, this suggests that nature alone is not sufficient to fully explain OCD and that the diathesis stress model helpfully offers an explanation for how nature and nurture may be both involved. For our third example, let's consider the fascinating and relatively new area of research into epigenetics. The study of genetics focuses on how genes and traits are passed on from one generation to the next. The genes that a child inherits from its biological parents provide information that guides its development, whether that is to do with what colour eyes they will have or how tall they will eventually grow. Epigenetics, on the other hand, is an area of scientific research that reveals how environmental influences affect the expression of our genes. Researchers discovered that when we experience certain events in our environment, it can leave a chemical marker on our DNA. These markers are thought to turn off and on certain genes. In other words, epigenetics is about how the experiences in a person's life can change the way their DNA is expressed. For example, psychologists have asked questions about how the trauma of war and conflict can have a lasting influence in later life. One professor of psychiatry and neuroscience who specialises in trauma research looked at pregnant women who were in New York City when 9-11 happened and were diagnosed with PTSD. She found that they had an unusually low level of the stress hormone cortisol. A traumatic experience can leave a marker on your genetic code that affects the expression of a certain gene, in this case how much cortisol the body is producing. But the disturbing surprise was that when they followed up with these mothers later on, when their children had been born, that the saliva of the nine-month-old babies of the women with PTSD also showed low cortisol. It looked like trauma could leave a trace in offspring even before they are born. The title of her article was How Parent Trauma Leaves Biological Traces in Children. Adverse experiences can change future generations through epigenetic pathways. She goes on to write that epigenetics potentially explains why effects of trauma may endure long after the immediate threat is gone. The experience in the environment, nurture, had influenced the way the genetics of the mother and her baby, nature, had been expressed. Nature and nurture interacting. But it's very hard to study these epigenetic changes over generations, not least because it takes such a long period of time. So this is where researchers turn to mice. In 2014, Brian Diaz and Kerry Resler gave male mice an electric shock when it smelled cherry blossom. 
These mice learn to associate the smell with the pain of the electric shock to the point that they developed a fear reaction whenever the cherry blossom smell was present. Okay, nothing surprising so far. Might ring a bell of the work of Ivan Pavlov and classical conditioning. However, what was remarkable was that when these male mice bred with female mice and had pups, the same smell led to a fear response in them even though these mice had never been exposed to the smell before and had never received electric shocks. They then took it one step further and found that even the grand pups of the original male mice showed a heightened sensitivity to that particular scent. And when they looked at the biology of the mice, they found epigenetic changes, chemical markers on the gene that encoded the smell and in the brain. And remember, this was in mice who had never been exposed to the cherry blossom smell and had never been electrically shocked. These effects were passed down for two generations. So if this doesn't demonstrate how interconnected nature and nurture are, I don't know what does. Finally, we come to the idea of constructivism and this man, Professor Robert Plomin, who is a behavioural geneticist at King's College London. Constructivism is, in his words, the idea that people shape and select environments well suited to their natures. Here's an example he gives. Imagine two sisters reared together, one of whom who is naturally more academic than the other. Each will make friends with people they feel comfortable with and who share similar interests. The more academic sister will most probably make friends with those who share her interests and are of a similar intellectual level. The other sister may feel uncomfortable in such an environment and will make friends with those who share her interests. For another example, a child who is genetically predisposed to be aggressive might choose to watch more violent films, play violent video games and take part in more physical contact type sports. This describes a theory that Scar and McCartney in 1983 called niche picking, where people voluntarily choose an environment based on their genetics. They create and shape environments that are best suited to them. The point that they are making is that it's not possible to explain the influences of a person's behavior in terms of just the environment or their genetics because one is interacting with the other. You cannot separate them. If you're ready to check out the next debate in psychology, you can click on the screen now or in the description below. And for more information on some of the material covered in this video, you'll find links to those videos and various articles too. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.